verse 1. I do appreciate the church here. We consider you all uh, in affiliation with us at HMA, and we, we love you and pray for you. And uh, I'm, I'm specifically praying for the projects and the property and the new buildings and things, the vision that Pastor has. Uh, that's really gripped me, and uh, we want to do our part, see what we can do to help in all of that and, and, and raise that generation up here in Marion that you all are reaching for. I'm going to read uh, Luke chapter 15, just to, just to shorten it down a little bit here because I've spoke so long. Uh, let me read verses 1, 2, and 3, and then 8 and 9. 1, 2, and 3, and 8 and 9. Luke 15 and 1, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, Drop down to verse 8. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she look, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Praise God. Mighty God in heaven. Yes. Lord, please, please, please do this and get all the glory for it for we know you share it with no man. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Somebody say amen. 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 You may be seated. I want to preach to the church tonight about the parable of the heart of God. The parable of the heart of God. First of all, I want to point you to the fact that even though you and I often refer to these verses as the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin and the parable of the prodigal son, that they would much, much more accurately be described as the parable of the shepherd and the parable of the woman and the parable of the father. But in all reality, these are not three parables. This is rather one parable three-part parable. Notice Luke chapter 15 and verse 3. It says, Jesus spake this parable unto them. And then it told the rest of the chapter, this parable. It is very important to the church to realize that this is one three-component parable. So for accuracy this evening, I'm speaking to you about the parable of the shepherd, the woman, and the father. This is not a parable about lost people. This is not a parable about sinful nature. This is not a parable about becoming lost. This is a parable about the character of the shepherd, the woman, and the father. In looking at the first section, the parable of the shepherd, it seems that the lamb was out for the day, led out with the other sheep by the shepherd. The primary reason for sheep to be led out is to eat. A sheep's appetite is its strongest desire. It no doubt fell for the old, the grass is always greener routine. I remember sitting uh, in the pickup at my son's house, waiting for them to come out of the house and, and go somewhere with me. And I was looking in his pasture there, and there were some horses in the, uh, eating in the pasture. And there were four adult horses and one little young, young horse, about half their size, maybe just weeks or days old. And the older horses seemed very content just standing in one place and eating the lush green tops off of the field grass. And the, the older uh, horses, they might take one or, or two steps just every few moments, every now and again. Their eyes seemed to just glaze over as they ate as if they were completely unaffected by the world around them. They were just right there eating grass, taking care of business. But that young fella was completely different. I began to watch the, the, the little guy and he would take a couple of bites of grass and then he would look up and he would run 15 or 20 yards and he would slam on the brakes, if you will, and he would eat two or three bites of grass and he would look around and he would dart off in another direction and, and, and run 15, 20, 30 yards and then stop and begin to eat a couple of bites. And he did this the whole time I was there. 
He traveled all over the pasture eating. Almost as if he was trying to make sure that he got the exact perfect best blades of grass possible before he got full. I imagine that that's just what happened to this little lost lamb. You see, lambs do not like to be alone, so he wasn't trying to get off on his own. Lambs do not generally have an adventurous nature, so he wasn't just looking around to see what was going on. Lambs like to stay close to mom, close to the herd, and close to the shepherd, but the truth is this lamb became lost not on purpose. He didn't mean to become lost. He surely didn't want to be lost, but he ended up lost by casually following his base appetite, his desires, his carnal, regular, natural instincts led him astray just like they will you. This lamb represents people that are lost today not because they're evil, not because they're wicked, not because they desire a wild lifestyle. This lamb represents people today that are lost because they merely refuse to keep their own desires and appetites of their natural carnal flesh in check. They were just, if it feels good, do it kind of people. They were just, uh, uh, that's what everybody else is doing kind of people. They were just float down the stream and go with the flow and, and, and everyone's doing it like this nowadays kind of people. Let's skip down. And look at another lost individual in this parable, the lost son. Specifically, the one that we call the prodigal, because in reality, the third section, this part about the father actually has two lost sons in it. The prodigal too was lost because of appetite, but his, but his appetites were much more base, much more wicked, much more demanding. Unlike the lamb, He didn't care who he hurt or what he destroyed along the way. He hurt his father. He tore up his family. When the lamb seemed to have ended up lost because of his lazy wanderings and his unwillingness to fight, to keep structure and put forth effort to stay on the right path and in the right place, the prodigal seems to be lost for all the opposite reasons. The prodigal actually put forth effort to become lost. Effort to take, effort to leave, effort to go, effort to find, effort to spend, effort to do wicked things. In the addiction fighting world, we at HMA Ministry see both of these personalities every day. We see those that are too lazy and don't care and just end up in bad places and in bad shape. And we see those that seem to have a drive to be rebellious and a thirst for evil and a hunger for wickedness. Looking at it this way, I think we can come to this conclusion if you'll allow me this much. The lamb appears to have become lost on accident and the prodigal seems to have become lost on purpose. With this in mind, let us go to the middle part of the parable and study for a few moments the lost coin in the the woman part of the parable. As it is with most people in the stories in the Bible, there's no reason to assume that this woman is anything other than poor or average in her wealth level. After all, she only lost one coin and yet searched for it diligently until she found it. The 10 pieces of money must have been some sort of dowry or savings or retirement, perhaps. I'm certain that she didn't just leave the money laying around, but perhaps she at times would let the children or the grandchildren look at it for a little while. Maybe they were allowed to uh, uh, pour the money out on the table and and, and look at it, perhaps uh, play with it, stack it up, play market with it or something. Probably the money was kept in a small earthen container or, or a sewn purse of some sort. Whatever it was, at some point, one piece, one coin was dropped was left laying around, rolled out of sight, something happened. And at one time or another, the money count was made. 
And I hate to assume so much, but I don't think that we're taking scripture out of context. We're just trying to color in the story without losing the point and the purpose. But I'm going to guess, Pastor Malden, that the money was missing for some little while before it was discovered that, that there was only nine pieces in the container. And now the truth was finally known. A coin is lost. There are so many significant details in just this middle portion of this one parable. Isn't it unique that when speaking of the lost, Jesus used something with automatic value, a coin. Think of the character of Christ when as he tells a story to other human beings and wants to signify what a soul means, he automatically gives it value. Everyone here has been taught from a very young age that coins are valuable. They are assets. They are good to have and desirable to further your cause with. My, my three-year-old granddaughter and even my one-year-old grandson, you could offer them toy or candy or quarter. They'll take quarter almost every time. That, that, that shiny thing, that, that, that special thing, that thing that we're hardly ever allowed to have one of. There's value. This is how God views people. This is how he described people. Jesus sees the immediate and automatic value of people. He counts them as assets and people are very desirable to, to further his cause. Anyway, the coin was found to be missing. A diligent search ensues. The lighting of dark places to see more clearly. The sweeping up of dust and debris to clear the path of sight and perspective. The, the effort put forth in the tireless search. It is at times like this I ask myself, have I let my life go out anywhere in my life? Am I accumulating dust and debris anywhere in my experience? Am I not working and keeping things well maintained in my relationship with Christ? It is very important to see just how immediate and active and ongoing that this search was as soon as she realized just one coin was missing. What is also important to note is the difference in how this coin was lost. We're going to peel back another layer. We're going to get a little deeper. Stay with me. I'll tie all this together here in a few moments. But the sheep and the son were lost both by their own behavior. The sheep was lost on accident by its own behavior. The son was lost on purpose by his own behavior. The coin was lost to no fault of its own because it had no behavior. Now, this is one parable of Jesus showing the three different categories of how souls become lost. Some of you are going to have to stay real close with me right here so I don't lose you. We must conclude that the coin was lost not because... It was lazy like the lamb, not because it was wicked like the sun, but because it was mishandled. Do we have ministry with understanding that there's three ways to become lost on accident, on purpose, and by being mishandled? Oh, help me, Jesus. The woman that owned and was in charge of the 10 coins was negligent in some way, shape, or form for the coin being lost. It was her coin. This would possibly explain for the diligence of the search, not only did the lost piece of money have great value to her, but she must have also felt a great sense of responsibility because it was lost in her watch. All of this in mind, we need to attempt to acknowledge some of the types and shadows in the text to be able to grind out the last and perhaps most important points in this context. As far as types and shadows go, I think the shepherd is the easiest one. Twice in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, Jesus referred to himself as the good shepherd. The shepherd in the parable is a type and shadow of Jesus, the shepherd of our souls. Next easiest would no doubt be the father. 
The father is the father. That was a tough one. That was hard. Continually throughout scripture, Old Testament as well as new, Jehovah God is called Father, our Father, our Heavenly Father. The Father in the parable is a type and shadow of Abba God. After the first two, things begin to, begin to get a little bit trickier, but I think we can still pretty confidently pin this thing down. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15 and verse 17, the prodigal son all of a sudden comes to himself. You all remember that phrase? He came to himself. Now, now to be fair, almost every book I've ever read, almost every preacher I've ever listened to, anybody that I've ever known to do a study on this pretty much agrees on something that I disagree with them on. <laughs> just, just, just putting it out there. I'm, I'm probably wrong. Everything I read says that the type and shadow of the father is the father and the type and shadow of the shepherd is the son and the type and shadow of the, the woman is the Holy Ghost. I disagree, but that's okay. We can all disagree, still be friends, still worship together, and you could still buy my lunch, okay? I, I get along great like that. I do not deny the presence of the, the third part of the Trinitarian Godhead in this parable but I place him somewhere else. The Bible very plainly says the prodigal son came to himself. He all of a sudden in his wicked lifestyle, after years and years of stealing, lying, rebelling, uh, fighting, hurting, damaging, running, escaping, all of years and years. You say, how do you know it was years and years? Because the Bible said after he left his father's house, a great famine arose. Famines do not arise in weeks or months. Famines arise in years. That was put there to let us know that there was a long period of time that took place there. So after after years of wickedness and years of rebellion and years of all of this horrible lifestyle, all of a sudden he came to himself and, and something happens and he gets this epiphany from heaven and in his heart of hearts down deep in his soul, he gets a message from heaven, from God that's been trying to be delivered all of this time and he hears it finally and it says drop the pail, jump the rail and hit the trail and he does that and he heads back to father's house and that was the the Holy Spirit of God. If you believe that that is the task and the office of the Holy Ghost is to allow men to get to rock bottom to find their hog pen and then arrest their conscience and chase them until they're willing to listen and hear and, and when they're at their most valuable point then woo them back to the Father which of course is what I believe then you see the Holy Spirit in the parable. You have the Father being Abba God. You have the Shepherd being Jesus Christ the Son. You have the Holy Ghost of Heaven doing his wooing job in the same story. If that's all true, then within this one parable, we have the loving, seeking, rescuing, receiving Shepherd Jesus Christ. We have the patient, searching, forgiving, gracious Heavenly Father. And we have the powerful, directing, prodding, helpful Holy Ghost, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Who's the woman? I have heard and read many places that the woman represent, I've, different people say that the woman represents all three of the Trinity. I've, some people say it's the Father again. Some people say it's the Son again. Some people say it's the Holy Ghost I agree that the woman's character matches any member of the triune Godhead. I agree. But the Bible is a very unique set of documents and it always agrees with itself. So where else in scripture do you find God typified directly in a female form? It doesn't exist. If God is typified directly in a human female form here as the woman, it's the only place in all 66 books where it happens. I struggle with that. Just call me weak, shallow-minded, whatever you have to do. I'm fine with it. I still struggle with it. 
Uh, granted, there are a couple places where Yahweh's attributes are like an unto a bear and its cubs or a, 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 a hen that would gather her brood, but, but they're very rare and they're always very vague and generic and they're always non-human forms. I personally do not, do not like scriptural interpretation that seems awkward and a stretch. Y'all ever heard one of them doctrinal statements that somebody's trying to make you believe and prove to you where they get a little half of a verse over here in Jeremiah and a little piece of a verse over here at the end of Matthew and they, they're trying to... Just, just tell me what the Bible says. There is someone, though, in the life of Jehovah Messiah God that is almost always referenced as a woman, his bride, the church, us. I'm, I'm just laying it out here for you, okay? I believe with everything in me that this woman in this parable is the church for several reasons, but the primary ones are because of the female reference and because of this, who else loses people from God by mishandling them? There's nobody else in the history of Christianity that ever let a soul slip through their fingers except the church. God didn't. Jesus didn't. He said, I've kept all these. We have. As I've already stated, there are many, many points to be attained in just this one little parable. But the most important one to me in 2019 is that this parable from the very lips of Christ Jesus himself seems to be an attempt to show how the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and the church should all have the exact same character, attributes, desires, and actions toward the lost. When Jesus began to doctrinalize to his prophets and his apostles and his newfound church leaders and explain to them how, the, how God will, will act toward the lost, how God will be receptive of the lost, how God will long for and love and search and find the lost, he included the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and the church. Do you see it? Do you see the searching shepherd savior? Do you see the searching father? Do you see the searching woman, the church? Do you see the diligent, unwavering shepherd savior searching for the sheep? Do you see the diligent, unwavering father still looking for the son? Do you see the diligent and unwavering woman searching for the coin, the church? Do you see the rejoicing shepherd savior when he gets the lamb back? Do you see the rejoicing father when he finally holds the son again? Do you see the rejoicing woman throwing the party for the neighborhood, the church? This whole parable is in the Bible to teach us that the church has to have the identical character toward the lost as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Remember, this is Christ's answer to the radical religious right as to why he receives and eats with sinners. He didn't just sit them all down one day and say, let me teach you all something. What happened was they say, what's wrong with you? You call yourself Messiah. You say you're the son of God. You say you're the savior of the world. We find you hanging out with prostitutes. We find you eating lunch with liars and, and, and hoods and gang members. We find you going around. Hey, you're not hanging out with the priests and the politician. You're hanging around with the pimps and the punks. Well, what is wrong with you? This is his answer. His answer is the father and the son and and the Holy Ghost and the church all act the same toward the lost. That's why the parable's there. 
I might, I might throw you a curveball right here, but I'm not sure that what he isn't saying here is not, not that he meets on the streets with sinners. It's not what he's saying. Everybody knows that. Not that he talks to sinners. Everybody knows that. Not that he's known to be seen where sinners are seen. I'm, I'm sure that's part of it, but look with me for a moment at the woman. She is the church. So who are her friends and her neighbors that she calls together and tells them to rejoice with her for she has found her lost coin? I know sometimes you listen to just, you, you used to just sitting there and just listening and dazing. I need you to interact with me just a little. I need your brains engaged right here. You got to help me through the last little bit of this, okay? Who is her friends and her neighbors that the Bible says that she calls, I, I know I'm tricking you, I know I am, just stay with me. I almost feel bad about it, almost. The Bible says she calls her friends and neighbors. Who are they? Someone might venture a guess and say, well, uh, it, it's her fellowship. The, the church folk that she runs with, or, or perhaps her denomination. Listen, dear saints of God and church goers, I hate to break the news to somebody this late in the game, but our church is not the church. Just the church folk you agree with and believe in and fellowship is not the church. Just not the Pentecostals, just not the, the holiness, not, just not the, the whatever terminology that man made up that you want to put on, on it over the door or on the paper or on the website. Just not those folk are going to heaven. This lady, this woman is the church. She does not represent a local body. She represents the bride of Christ at large. She is the church as a whole. All the saved Baptists, all the born again charismatics, all the redeemed Lutherans, all the covered by the blood Pentecostals. She is the church. If what I'm proclaiming to you is true, then, then the middle part of this parable depicts something that doesn't usually happen in most churches that I go to. I'm going to ask you again. If she is the whole church, who's her friends? You want a hint? They don't go to church. Oh, I love the Bible. <laughs> This seems to show me that the church, the woman, living in her house, the sanctuary, if you will, spending all her time in her relationship with Jesus, spends the important parts of her day and night caring for and living in the holy places that she abides in, but she also is, is, is well acquainted with many friends that are not a part of her household, not a part of her system, not a part of her way of doing things, not a part of the faith, if you will. And it seems that she even has relationships with neighbors that are only close close in proximity, but not uh, even made friends with, yet she interacts with all of those people outside of the church world, mind you, well enough that when some great thing does happen inside the church world, like one that is lost is found, oh, praise God, that she has enough sway and camaraderie with them that they will come and see and even celebrate the good that has happened in her house. Oh, somebody needs to get this. What that teaches me 
is that I live for God. I love God. I live a holy, righteous, separated life for God. I fellowship the church. I fellowship the saints. The church and the saints are my family and they're God's family, the most important people to me. And it is my job and my duty to have effective relationships with people all around my community and all around my neighborhood and all outside the church world where I go to church and place my importance that if any great thing happened in the church, I would have enough sway with those that are outside the church that I could say, hey man, you won't believe this. One of the biggest drug dealers in this town got saved Sunday morning at my church. You got to come help us enjoy this moment. Is that the way church is working with y'all? Oh, Jesus. I know, I know. This is a little much for some of you, I understand. But what are you going to do with the scriptures? What are you going to do with the fact that Jesus Christ was a friend of publicans and sinners? And if we were holy living people that kept up our house, if you will, had a good prayer life and a good Bible study life and and was faithful attending in the house of God and we paid our tithes and offerings faithfully and we didn't drink and we didn't smoke and we didn't cheat and we didn't steal and we didn't lie and we were good friends with and honored to be around and considered respectable by uh, some of those that, that, that are counted as important in our community as well as some of those that are counted very unimportant in our community community and we're friends with and have relationship with the lost barber and the lost grocer and the lost insurance agent and the lost fire chief and the lost city council member and the lost Mexican and the lost black person and the lost white trash and the lost millionaire and the lost poor person and the lost well-to-do person that we could speak something into their life and say I've been hanging out with you talking to you being your friend doing business with you all of this time and now I want to tell you about some glorious thing that my God has done and I want you to come celebrate that with me. And they would respond. To the point that if a drunkard got saved at my church on Sunday morning or a wayward addict grandson was delivered on Sunday night, that it would be commonplace, part of my routine to reach out to the poor and the well-to-do and the Republican and the Democrat and the city councilman and the barber throughout the day on Monday and Tuesday and on Wednesday and simply say to them, hey, buddy, come with me Wednesday night down to the church house and, and help us celebrate this amazing thing that God has done in our community, yours too. Does Christ's depiction of the woman, the church, does it look like us? Because that's his point. See, what we maybe fail to think about because we're so spiritual sometimes is that Jesus made an extremely valid communal point with this parable in the sense that it doesn't matter if you're a Baptist or a Presbyterian or a Pentecostal or a Charismatic or a Nazarene or an atheist or an agnostic. If you live in this neighborhood and and a drug dealer gets saved in this neighborhood, it's good for you. That's one last chance for you to get broke into. Oh, y'all ain't going to help me. That's one last chance for you to get lied to. That's one last chance for somebody to come begging at your front door. That's one last chance for your lawnmower to end up missing. Y'all ain't going to help me. All Jesus is saying is when I do a good thing for your community in in your house, 
in your house. You should have good enough relationships with everybody in the community, whether they believe in me yet or not, that they should understand that you think they should help celebrate me for doing that. <laughs> Praise God. I don't know if there's any Baptists here tonight. Forgive me if, if you are. But I was preaching uh, a homeless mission outreach in downtown Tulsa. And we started with nothing. We just started in the, in, actually we started in a kitchen. And we grew into this little shop and then this borrowed sanctuary and then this bigger church. We ended up running about 500. And I was running this, this ministry of about 450 to 500 street people that we were having church with three times a week. <clears throat> and it was mostly all hard, hardcore, radical, radical, far, far right wing holiness Pentecostals, okay? Which is my background. That's where I'm from. <clears throat> and that made up the majority of the people except for the hundreds of street people that we we're working with. And this little old man, this little woman come, they were probably in their 80s maybe, and they were, they were Baptists. Amazing people. I love them. Like, I mean, like grandparents to me, you know, just took to them. They took to me. And I noticed that my staff, whenever they would run a service, when that elderly Baptist couple was there, my, my staff would kind of run it with the brakes on. They, they, they'd ease into the service. They, they'd kind of hold it down a little bit like they were like they were taming it down for the Baptists, you know. <laughs> and I said uh, I finally got a couple of my guys aside. I said, yo, what are you doing? <laughs> and they said, well, we're afraid we're going to scare those people off. I said, let me tell you all something. The Holy Ghost don't scare saved people. Now, you may be up here running, Wah! acting all crazy and jumping and shouting. They may just be sitting back there. They may not do it the way you do it. But the Spirit of God is in saved people. Amen. And the Spirit doesn't scare Save people. I said, if your spirit scares a genuinely saved person, you got the wrong spirit. I, I'm going to tell you all right now, I'm saved, sanctified, filled, the Holy Ghost, been preaching for 22 years, and I've seen some people's spirit that scared me. All right? But I don't think it was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I, had this lady one time, it was her thing. She would show up at church and she'd wait till the song got real high and she'd run and she'd jump into the arms of somebody and, <laughs> and you're supposed to catch her, right? I thought, I thought it was creepy. Well, one night she got all full of something and came running over her and jumped at me and I went, step back, she went, Pfft. I wouldn't, that wasn't my deal, all right? So I told my guys, I said, man, you get a hold of God and you run that service. And so that night, those Baptist folk come and, and a young man got a hold of this power of God and the spirit of God fell. And people were crying and praying and shouting and running and crying. And, and this, this uh, uh, pimp slash drug dealer that had been causing us all kinds of problems, he was there that night in the back row and he got under conviction and he came down and he fell down in the ground and was just crying and begging God to forgive him and save him and boy, all the brothers were right there praying over him and everything and, and I noticed a couple of my guys, they were still they looking back there for them Baptist folks yeah, they were going to take this and, and so I looked back there and that guy went praise the Lord What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying he enjoyed and celebrated and gave credit for what God was doing in the house. Amen. Amen. All right, all right. So this coin was not lost on accident and was not lost on purpose. It was lost through no fault of its own. It was lost because it was mishandled. I believe the Lord is trying to show us something here about the different types of lost, broken, hurting people that we will encounter. Because I know a lot of great ministries that are only having services and ministries for one or two of the three types. And God wants us to have 
services and ministries for all types. Amen. We need to have services for and sermons for and lessons for and be prepared to help people like the sheep that never really turn their life completely over to Christ and they just wander around trying to buy what they want and get what they like and keep up with the Jones, just following their base desires right into hell if we don't reach them. We also need to have services for and sermons for and lessons for and be prepared to help people like the prodigal that will run hard and burn bridges and waste resources and, quote, live it up until the enemy of their soul finally gets them beat down and burnt out and broken because the Holy Spirit of God will search them out and deal with them at some point. It is inevitable. It is the plan of God. And we must also not forget that sandwiched in Christ Jesus' parable right between the blatant drug addict, uh, rebellious youth, and the wandering, misstepping, keep up with the pop culture, not paying attention to anything but what is right in front of their nose, average American is the mishandled. The mishandled. The one that probably sits right here in the room tonight. Still in the house, very dusty in their spirit, very neglected feeling in their psyche, hiding in plain sight. The one we just didn't pay enough attention to. The one that we never really got around to checking on or understanding why they do what they do. Church, I don't know if I'm making a point or making a mess, but I, I really feel this right here. There are some amongst us that are lost just because we have not treated them with all the proper tools, relational skills, and respect that God created humans to need. Some are lost because we have just misplaced and mishandled them. They wanted a friend and we only provided a preacher. They needed love and we only offered rules. Help me, Jesus. They were looking for someone to care and we showed up as someone who corrects. That is exactly the problem that these religious Pharisees had with Jesus on this day that he told this amazing parable. Why are you consoling and consorting with these broken, messed up folk when you should be correcting them? Why are you loving them when it is plain that you should be lashing out at them? And this parable is Christ's answer. Because some of them are lost on accident. Some of them are lost on purpose and some of them are lost because you, the religious people that are asking me this question, have had them in your care and cared for them incorrectly. If you look at the heart, the diligence, the love, the mercy, the forgiveness of the shepherd, the woman, and the father, it doesn't seem to matter if you're lost on accident, lost on purpose, or lost through no fault of your own. The response is always the same in all three parts of the parable. You are valuable, you are sought, and you are loved. And if you'll come, you'll be received. This is the point of the parable. The entire parable has been dissected a million ways to Tuesday and so many times we miss the point. The point is, regardless of how you're lost, anything that is in direct relationship with God loves you, is for you, is seeking you, is searching you, wants you, and will receive you. A couple more things very quickly. Uh, one for the individual and then one for the church at large. First, for the individual, I need to finish the story of the woman and her, her found coin, and I need to finish it, if you'll allow me, with my imagination. She searches and sweeps and dusts and moves things all around. 
Notice she does this so actively that it seems that people in the area know about it. It appears that as soon as she found it, she was able to tell the neighbors and townsfolk that, that the search was over, come celebrate immediately as if they already knew what she was talking about. Please, I tell people this all over America, all, all over the world, please, please do not tell me about your outreach and your evangelistic efforts that nobody in your community even knows about. It wasn't that long ago I went to a church here in the United States, and they were, oh, Brother Sloggett, we love your outreach. We do that too. Oh, Brother Sloggett, we like what y'all are doing. We do that too. We have this uh, feeding program, and we have this kids program. We have this uh, ministry and this. Uh, and so the next day, I did what I always do. I go around town. I talk to folk. I meet them. I tell them about the church. I tell them about the revival. Get my hair cut. Wash my car. Get a sandwich. Tell everybody I know about Jesus, about the local church, about the local revival. And I begin to ask people, hey, you know about the church down here? Never heard of it. Went to the next place. Hey, do you know about the outreach that's going on around? Never heard of it. Went to the next place. One, I told this story. One guy said, how big of a town was it? I said, about 1,200 people. In the parable, I'm taught that when the woman, the church, loses something as valuable as a soul, that the search is so immediate, so diligent, so active, so big, so huge, so amazing, so much is going on that lost people in the immediate vicinity even know that it's happening. Don't tell me about your outreach if nobody in the community even knows it's happening. Anyway, I gotta move on. She finds the coin. If she's like any other woman that I know, my wife, my grandma, my pastor's wife, probably Sister Malden, if she's like any of these women that I know, her actions, once she found it, are so predictable. Now remember, it's been lost for a long time. It's been off somewhere way out of the way, obviously, because it wasn't found very easily. So I can only assume it's at least dirty. Any woman I know would have found it, would have started, <laughs> started cleaning it up. Ain't that like a mama? Your mom ever do that thing to you where she lick her thumb and wipe your face? What in the world? <laughs> my wife did that to my granddaughter the other way. She like, what's on your face? I was like, don't do that. It's 2019. We have germs we didn't have in the 70s. I can only imagine she just got out her apron, you know. Y'all still some of y'all still have those aprons? <laughs> Cleaning them off with Clean them off, get the little grooves. You know what the grooves are for, anybody? <clears throat> Catch me another time when I'm not preaching, I'll tell you what the grooves are for. <laughs> they're, they're, those grooves have very important reason in, in history. <clears throat> I can only imagine, I can only imagine that she finds it and immediately begins to clean it up. That's, that's what mama would do. Surely as soon as possible, she puts it back in her coin purse or satchel so as to not lose it again. Then she calls the friends and neighbors and they all come over and the celebration begins. Now, I don't know y'all as well as I know me because I'm with me almost all day, every day. Okay? But I know what I would do. 
If that lady invited me over to her house because she found that coin and everybody walked in and started getting their, their drink and their sandwich and sitting around talking about it, I, I know what I'd walk right in there. I'd say, let me see it. Let me see it. I would want to see it. I would want to see the reason why we're having this celebration. You know, my grandson was born at the hospital a year ago yesterday. And there was people literally who walk in the hospital room and start talking to my son. Walk in the hospital room, see my wife, start talking to my wife. I'm like, hey, he's over here. <laughs> this is why we're here. You don't want to see this? Are you crazy? If I went over to the celebration of the replacement of the coin, I would say, where is it? I want to see it. I could just imagine her get out her 10 coins here. Ten. Not nine anymore. Ten. They're all there. Ten. Woo! Let's celebrate. Ten. I know what my next question would be. Which one is it? And if I understand scripture correctly, she would go like this. I can't tell. I just told you the most important thing I'll probably tell you this week. I can't tell. Y'all ever been somewhere and you felt like the odd one? Yes. Yes. Y'all ever been at church? I think it's this. No, it's not that. It might be this. No, no. Can't tell. Oh, that does something inside me. I went to a church the other day to preach for the first time, and they're like, oh, this is brother so-and-so. He's a deacon, and this is so-and-so. This is the pastor's wife, and this, and this, this is Billy. He was a drug addict. And I said, really, how long have you been clean? He said, 17 years. Oh. See, they can still tell. Y'all ain't good. They, they, they said that to the wrong guy, see? I'm, I got this problem with my mouth. They said, here's Billy. He, he was a drug addict. I said, how long have you been clean? He said, 17 years. And I turned to him and I said, how long does he have to be clean when he's just Brother Billy? See, they can still tell. I was at a church one time. They said, this is Brother Tim, and this is Brother Bill, and this is Sister Sandy, and that, that back there, that's Sister Susie. She's divorced. I said, why do I need to know that? See, they can still tell. Help me, Jesus. My point for the church is this. You are the woman. You were included in the perfect plan of God to have the same compassions, the same energies, the same actions as the father and the son. If at any point we, the church, are not seeking out lost sheep, lost sons, and lost coins for the sole purpose of redeeming them to the rightful place in the fold, the family, and the home. We are sinning. 
I'm tired of outreach being this cute little thing that some strange Christians do on the side. You're not a church without it. You're not the bride of Christ until you do it. To sin is to intentionally break from the known will of God. If you're not helping us search for the lost, if you're not diligently going and finding and getting and loving and cleaning up and polishing and replacing, you are a poor excuse for the woman. You are a neglectful bride. You are a miserable mother. I speak to you as part of the church world as a whole and in general. I'm not talking about this congregation in Marion. But but if, if you are lost, if you are hurting, if you are broken, if you are bitter, cold, or indifferent, you are what our efforts are for. You are who we desire. You are why we came tonight. You are why I drove from Tulsa. We long to carry you back to the fold, to clean you up, to celebrate your getting put back in a place of honor that you belong in, to put a royal robe around your shoulders and a holy signet on your hand and to never know the difference again. Because we have the identical character toward the lost as the father and the son does. (laughs) Church, do you see how number one, lost is lost and the manner in which you became lost is not the story. The church needs to grasp that. We, we, we categorize the lost. We got little boxes. Oh, that's a pretty clean cut looking lost man. What in the world does that mean? I had a guy sitting across the table from me in my, in my office the other day and, and he, we were doing some counseling and he said, I'm not like you preacher. I don't know what that means. I know you're Puerto Rican. I'm white. You know, I'm 6'8". You're 5'4". Yeah, we're not. I get it. We're not identical. I get it. He said, no, I'm not like you. I said, what do you mean? He said, if I get saved, I won't sit there with a long sleeve shirt on and a a high collared undershirt under my shirt and, and, uh, he said, I've got tattoos. And I said, I've got tattoos. He said, what? I said, you can't see them right now. What does that have to do with anything? I said, besides, how do you know you won't do that? But what he's used to, he's used to a church world system that categorizes well, there's a good kid. He's never been in trouble or anything. If he'd get saved, he might make a preacher. Ah, uh, y'all. Don't make me come down there. <clears throat> you know, as a general rule, <laughs> oh, help me, Jesus. We don't see that guy with the tattoos up to here, the tattoos all the way down to here. Got them little mini frisbees in his ear. You may see him and say, oh, I pray that God saves that boy. But how often do you see him and say, I bet he'd make a good preacher. I know, I know. You say, don't judge me, preacher. I, I, all right, all right. Well, we have to learn from this parable is number one, lost is lost. And the manner in which one became lost is not the story. And number two, the church is included in the heart of God. This is the parable, the three point parable of the heart of God. The father, the son, and the church. And the Holy Ghost is in there. But the parable 
is about the identical character towards the lost of the Father and the Son and the church. If you're going to be a part of the church, you are part of the heart and the plan of God or you're an imposter. This is a parable of the diligence of the Savior Shepherd, the long suffering of the mercy of Jehovah Father, and the church bride woman that is known to be in diligent search of lost valuable objects that were neglected, misplaced, need found, cleaned back up, and celebrated. And this parable of Christ Jesus holds within its teachings the idea that a true church, after the very heart and mannerisms of Christ, will be actively known to have relationships with sinners and use those relationships to witness to them, to work with them, even convict them and convince them by including them in the celebrations of all the glorious things that are done in this house. Now, as we get ready to pray, can I put that into a practical format for you? Absolutely, I can. I just thought of it. See, I believe with all my heart, I have for about five years that this church is going to expand all the way across to the street over there. And I can envision things that can happen here by listening to the pastor speak about a building next door and a, and a bigger building even further next door and about plans and things in the development of this property back here. And putting that thought into place with the thought of this parable, what does that look like? Let me tell you what that looks like. It means that when you have a grand opening of the new youth ministry center over here on the corner lot, the big bill I saw drawn up on the paper, <coughs> that when, when we have the 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 grand opening of the ministry center over here. What a traditional Western civilized cultured Christian church would do in these modern times would be to invite all of us and any of our family that's ever been directly connected with this church and, and the pastors and the friends of ours from uh, Bowling Green, I think, and the other places that we know that we fellowship And we would have a, a grand celebration over here with a, with, a, with a potluck and a bake sale and whatever y'all, however you guys do all that cool stuff. Pepperoni pizza with sliced tomatoes on top. That's the inside joke. <laughs> but if you were in the doctrine the teachings of this parable. What would happen is we would have the grand opening of the big new youth ministry center over here. And we would invite church folk and the family members and the people from Bowling Green and the, the different ones. And we would invite specifically and importantly and, and, and give high regard and, and great esteem to the position of them coming. Other pastors in this area, this rougher part of Marion over here, and business owners in this community right here, and, and the guy that owns the ice cream shop over here, and all the little kids and the, the, the other older people that walk up and down the streets here, and, and this lady living in this little house right here. And, and folk that live back here and the guy that owns the steel company over here. And they would be the predominance of our focus as we celebrate what God's doing. Because it would be one thing for us all to get together and, and kind of pat ourselves on the back and pat God on the back for accomplishing this thing through us. That would be great. It feels good to do things like that. 
but would it be the focus of the Father and the focus of the Son and the focus of the Holy Ghost to do that? I don't believe so. I believe that if the man that owns the steel shop that gave you such a good deal on the property back here that finally saw you realizing your dreams and, and came because he was invited and, and maybe lost as lost can be and, and sees that he was maybe involved and, and, and maybe the community is finally coming together and, and meets little Jeremiah and little Susie and little Billy and little, little Wendy and, and realizes that you're doing things in these children's lives that that may prick his heart and something inside him may say, you know what? I'm for this too. I'm glad you're doing this, church. I'm glad for your God and your vision, your way of doing things. And who knows what could happen that maybe he could be brought back into the house, to the family. What would happen then? What would happen? I know what would happen if we were in the will of God and the plan of God. What would happen is we would put him right up there. And then the next Sunday and the next Sunday and the next Sunday, we wouldn't keep the next time. I came back from Tulsa a year or two years later. Hopefully nobody points him out to me and said, that's the guy that, no, we would say, that's old brother Jim back there. He's one of us now. He fits right. When we raise our hands, he raises his hand. When we cry, he cries. When I preach, he says amen. When we pass the plate, he gives in it. It's practical to understand the point of the parables of Christ and in this particular point, this particular parable, the point is that there has to be a way to live a holy, separate, sanctified life and be in direct relational interaction with the lost at the same time. Because if you're not, they won't come celebrate when God does something in our house. How many of y'all want folk to come here tomorrow night? And the next night? And the next night? How many of you know how hard it's going to be to get folk to come here that you've never had interaction with before? That's the point of the parable. Not waiting until revival and then just trying to cold turkey, get the guy to 7-Eleven to come to church. But talking to him, working with him, being his friend, checking on him, telling him what's going on in your life, finding out what's going on in his life, going to the hospital when his aunt has surgery. And then when God does something great, hey, hey, buddy, hey, old friend, Hey, come be a part of this. Praise God. Stand all over this house. <clears throat> I make a two-part altar call, but I'm going to give it all at once. Let me give my two components, and then we'll all pray together. Altar call number one is this. If you're here, and you're hurting and you feel awkward and you don't fit in and you've had trouble in the past getting comfortable in a church, in a congregation. You don't feel like you fit in or believe the same or, or maybe you've been mishandled maybe somewhere else. This is Christ's story about your life. It says we seek as diligently for you as we do sheep and sons. It says we care as much about you as we do sheep and sons. It says we'll search for you till we find you. We'll do whatever we have to to help you get cleaned up and get in your rightful place to where you're just one of the family again. And this altar calls for you. But it's also for the church member that maybe forgot or didn't realize or has just gone 
about their business and got so busy that we feel like if I read my Bible through in a year and if I say my prayers a bit every night and if I give so much in the offering each time and if I show up on Sunday morning and sometimes even on Sunday night and every once in a while maybe on midweek service and I just kind of, I keep my, my cross around my neck and my Jesus freak bumper sticker on my minivan. I'm a, I'm a good, decent Republican, Christian, American. But you forgot. who we are. We are the seekers, the searchers, the lovers, the finders, the winners of the lost. All of that other, just part of it. That's just the structure. That's just the basis to be able to do what we're here to do. Then this altar calls for you too. I'm going to open up this altar right now. And I don't know how everybody does it different. I've never really got the hang of how y'all do it around here. Some people pray better with music or without music. Some people pray better than the pew and at the altar. I, I'll be honest with you, I thought it was a really, really weak altar service this morning. Maybe that's normal. I don't know. It doesn't matter. We're all still friends. It's all great. Uh, but, but I really want to see some folk just get together as the body of Christ and come and gather around the front of this church and kneel or stand or however you do and just... Just let all of this get absorbed in you. Come up here and stand up here and say, God, help me, remind me, make sure I'm doing my part. Or come up here and kneel at this altar and say, oh God, I've been hurt and I've been broke and I've been passed around and I've never really settled down and I need to hit the rock and become part of the body of Christ. If you can pray like that with us this evening, won't you come right now? And let's gather around the front of this church. And let's begin to seek the face of God and let his words, his system, his rules, his burdens penetrate us. Praise God. You don't know how much I would love to see somebody that the devil has lied to and tricked and tormented and, and made you feel like an oddball and an outcast and different. And how much I would love to see you realize the power of this parable tonight that says that the system of God searches for you, loves you, wants to help you and receive you and find you and work with you until you feel apart. Amen. 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 A part of what's going on around here. Come on, let's pray. Everyone that will, let's pray. Come on, let's come around the front of this church. Lay your hands on a brother. Put your arm around a sister. Say, oh God, help this one. God, work on this situation. God, move in this life. Praise, praise the blessed name of Jesus.